But let's go ahead and get going on uh, this topic for our uh, day today, which is transition towns. And so what is uh, transition towns all about? What's the name from and how did it get started? The transition initiative, as it's also sometimes termed, is um, it was started by a good friend of mine back in Britain uh, about three or four years ago now. And he was, um, Rob Hopkins was the person who started it all. Mm -hmm. And he had an interest in climate change, but um, wasn't so aware of the issue around peak oil, the, the idea that we will at some point, some say we've already have reached it, some say in the coming years, reach that point when um, half the extractable oil f has been taken out of the earth. From there on in, um, demand increases as supply lessens. And how do we cope with that? Rising prices brought about by supply and demand, and it's going to affect every aspect of our society. And so what Rob wanted to look at was how we transition, how we move from today, where we have relatively cheap oil, to a, to a time in the future, possibly only 20 or 30 years hence, when oil is going to cost more, it's going to affect every aspect of our society, how do we make that transition? And his particular interest was the size of the problem is so big, it's taken us 150 years sort of in the lifetime of oil on this planet to get here. We're probably going to have to make this transition very, very quickly, and it's going to be too big a problem for government and too big a problem as well for the general public. But if we all come together as a community and work together, then there's a possibility we might be able to make that transition from what, now to the future. What made um, Totnes, England so receptive to this idea? Totnes, I, I sometimes think of it as like a, a small version of, of Portland. It's a very turned on alternative community there. Um, Rob moved there with the idea of wanting to explore this idea. He originally st started it in, in Ireland, but he moved to Totnes because of the re receptivity of, of the community, really. Mm -hmm. Spent a year networking, sharing his ideas, and then the project took off from there. And what was your role in that project? I, I've known Rob, as I say, for a number of years, and um, I helped in one of the initial think tanks around how transition might work, what the challenges might be, where it might go. Um, and also, uh, Part of transition is not only looking at the, the, um, the outer aspect in terms of how we recreate our communities, but also the, the inner aspect. And, and, and I know some of the people he was liaising with with, with that in, in terms of how we um, uh, deal with, how we cope with this news that, that, that we are going through transition. So I, I helped a bit on that as well. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to come back to that in just a second, David. Mm -hmm. Jim, what's your role with Transition PDX? I helped get it started, I guess. Uh, a friend of mine and I realized about um, a little over a year ago now that uh, given peak oil, given climate change and what's likely, the changes that are likely to limit our future access to resources, that we would all narrow our horizons and we began looking for ways to organize communities mm -hmm. for resilience and then we just happened on, uh, on, on well, David already given one talk, he was asked to give a talk to the Portland Peak Oil Group, and we heard about that. And we'd attended that, and my friend and I had both worked with the Peak Oil Task Force that the city organized a couple of years ago. And we just realized this is the thing that makes a lot of sense. And the more we studied it, the more really useful this framework seems to be. Well, that leads me to a question. There are lots of different frameworks out there for how to transition um, communities and how to how to uh, kind of shift our thinking given climate change and in peak oil. So what's different about this particular framework? I feel as though it's a loose set of tools that any community can take. Um, it's not saying do it this way. Mm -hmm. It's a loose set of ideas which any community can take, use all the, um, the projects they already have going and it can bring these projects together. You, know, you might have a lot of different projects going on in the city, but if they're not talking with each other, there can always, there can sometimes be um, maybe a bit of antagonism, or if, if that's not happening, at the very least, there isn't a sharing of ideas. You bring people together, you start sharing these ideas, and so much more comes out of, um, of the, pos the possibilities that arise, I think, are so much greater then. And so the transition model, I think, gives a framework on which you can bring together what you're already doing and help to move forward. It's certainly not another thing coming into town and saying, you know, move out the way, we're here. It's a framework, I think, on which you can hang what you're doing. And that's certainly what I'm getting from people I've met over the last year or so here in Portland already engaged in the projects. 
Okay, great. Now we're yeah. going to talk a little bit more about what some of those tools are that you just mentioned. Um, but I want to come back to something you said earlier, because I saw this on the website ab mm -hmm. about the founder. And he talks about um, the, the head, the heart, and the hands of right. making a transition. And you started to talk about that a mm -hmm. second ago. Could you say more about that? Sure. I, another thing I like about the transition movement, it, it's, it's a very holistic way of looking at this process. It's very easy and very important to look at you know, where our food is going to come from, where our energy is going to come from, and things like that, finance, local finance. But this is also acknowledging the fact that we have to understand the problem, first of all. So we've got the head side of it, actually understanding really what it is we're up against so that our, our response is proportional to the problem. It's not, um, it doesn't get too caught up. It doesn't, it doesn't end up being something too, too exaggerated or too small. Um, then you also have how we actually cope with this news. And we all cope with this in different ways. It's very challenging to the future that we are told that we might have in front of us. If, if you're based upon the idea that things will only get better or things will carry on as they are, um, then something like peak oil puts a big challenge to that. If your life is spent, the idea of flying around the world and traveling a lot, peak oil puts a big stop in that. And different people will cope with that news in different ways. And so you've got the heart side of it. Mm -hmm looking at how we cope with it. It also helps you deal with other people as you work with people as, as they take this news on board. Um, and then the hand side of it is just the practicalities of going out there and working out alternative energy, growing local food, and sourcing local clothes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I like this holistic approach. It's not, it's not saying we only need to go out and grow local food and the problem solved. It's recognizing we're a holistic people. The world is, is holistic. We need to work on all aspects of the problem. But I, re I really like that because as an organizational you know, development mm -hmm. coach and consultant, that's that's exactly what, what attracts me. So I can mm -hmm. understand, Jim, why when you heard David speak, you went, mm -hmm. ah, mm -hmm. this is a framework we want right. to use. Right. So could you just say uh, a little bit about how did this really get started in Portland? Well, we just started it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we just got together, had a meeting, and said, "Let's go." And mm -hmm. so, and we had no idea what we were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're making it up as we go along, and um, we still are. I have a, an idea that Rob did that and taught us. Although uh, he's a smarter man than I, so he had a little more organization and purpose in it. But um, we just stumbled from one solution to the next. I mean, you know, if, if you're looking at the question of how do we build a society that in 50 years or 70 years will be more or less self-sufficient because we can't get food, which, you know, normally now we go to a grocery store, the food comes from 1,500 miles away on an average. Well, if it has to come from within a day's walk or, you know, or and we can't bring it in on trucks anymore, then what do we do? Um, how do we get clothing under those circumstances when it may come in from China or it may not and you know that all those questions come up so obviously we're making it up as we go along and, and um, we just formed a core group and started studying it and um, D David gave us a lot of encouragement and a lot of information and actually we've had people come in from England here in the last month to give us a two-day training on their experience but um, what were the key um, and maybe I should ask yeah, this of you David you know, what were the key learnings that you had from from the experience in England? I would say the main things is, is that, it almost might sound very obvious, but no community is the same. Rob developed these ideas over a course of um, a couple of years, let's say, of, of trying out transition within, within Portland. But there, there are 12 ingredients that make up the, the transition movement, which is found to work. They're not prescriptive. You don't have to follow them all, and they don't necessarily fit in one order. Uh, and, and but. It, these were ideas, these were real life um, scenarios which he found helpful and had intended to work. But as they've moved around into different communities, different communities have, have used them within their own way. So I think that probably one of the main learning is, is this is not a mold that you just pick up and put there and say, right, you do it like this. You are given a set of, it's like giving you, a, teaching you how to use a skill like carpentry, for example, you then use that and take it out into your own world to use it in the way which is most beneficial. I would say that has been the most, the biggest learning. And the, the other learning for me, which really inspires me about this movement, is how you can give people, you bring people together, um, give them these tools, and how they can use them all, all their myriad of different ways. Um, and, and from that, so many wonderful exper um, experiences can come out of it. 
And right. I think that, I th to me, that's where the real inspiration for this comes. It's about inspiring ordinary people, ordinary communities. It's not about waiting for leaders. It's not denying that the role that leaders play, but it's, not, it's saying, look, you can do something about your future. You don't have to wait for somebody else to, to do it. Well, I like that it's, um, it's kind of like a set of tools that the, the neighborhood itself or the community itself uses and adapts right. based mm. on what they need. Totally. So mm -hmm. that's yes. exciting. Yeah.